Welcome to this first segment of Search the Scriptures Daily and our continuing discussion of Dave Hunt's latest book, Judgment Day, Islam, Israel, and the Nations. We're in chapter 12, titled, Some Important Distinctions. And the primary distinction addressed is between Roman Catholicism and biblical Christianity. Dave, as we mentioned last week, the majority of Jewish people, practically all, you could say, make no distinction between Catholics and evangelicals, which leads to some serious misunderstandings. Tom, as we mentioned last week, one of the biggest complaints that Jewish people have against Christians or Christianity is that it was the Christians who persecuted them down through the centuries. Hitler was a Christian, wasn't he? Well, he was never excommunicated from the Catholic Church. Neither was Mussolini. So they have a misperception that Catholics are Christians. Now, you can't call yourself a Christian unless you follow the teachings and example of Jesus Christ, unless you follow the Bible and the gospel and the Catholic Church, and we won't get into a big doctrinal thing about that, but the Catholic Church openly says it does not just go by the Bible, it goes by church tradition as well. And as you know, an ex-Catholic tradition is on the same level as the Bible. Right. Uh, furthermore, you can't really understand the Bible. The church alone can interpret it, okay? So the Catholic Church itself was one of the worst persecutors of Jews down through history. It was the popes who first put them in ghettos, made them wear an identifying badge or a yellow hat or or whatever. The, the Crusades, as we mentioned, First Crusade under Pope Urban II slaughtered Jews all across Europe. We document this, of course, more thoroughly in A Woman Rides the Beast because that's not the major topic of this particular book, but it's very important to this subject. And when they got to Jerusalem, they chased the Jews into the synagogue, set it ablaze. They slaughtered not only Turks, but Jews as well. Mm-hmm. Okay? But these were not Christians. They waved a cross. They were members of the Catholic Church, but they were not evangelical Christians. There is a big distinction, and that distinction somehow isn't made by most Jewish people. David, what surprises me is that some of the books that you quote, very insightful by Jewish scholars and so on, they even miss this. Right. It's, It's a little hard to believe. You know, maybe not. Many evangelicals don't know what Roman Catholicism teaches, right. what what they believe, and we see a trend mm-hmm. that seems to be growing rapidly that there is no difference between Roman Catholics and biblical Christians. Right. We're born-again Christians, evangelical Christians. Right. So in the book, we take a little bit of time, a few pages, to point out that the Catholic Church killed more evangelical Christians than it killed Jews. So they couldn't have been evangelical Christians. Why did they kill them? Because they would not give their allegiance to Rome. These were not even Protestants. This was before the Protestant Reformation. They weren't protesting anything. They never had given their allegiance to Rome and to the popes. They were outside of that church. If we're going to get on to uh, Israel, true friends, evangelical Christians, and we've been, I used the term, you used it a number of times just now. For our audience, for those listening to us who have don't really understand the term. How would you define an evangelical Christian? Well, an evangelical Christian, evangel, that refers to the gospel, to the good news. And it is good news that Christ died for our sins on the cross, that he was buried and rose again the third day, that he paid the full penalty for our sins. Nothing else is needed. And that's critical because much of what you just articulated Roman Catholics would say, well, wait a minute, I believe that, but not paying the full penalty for our sins and not accepting it by faith and faith alone. The Council of Trent met 1545 to 63 in response to the concerns of the Reformers who didn't want to leave the Catholic Church. They wanted the Catholic Church to be Reformed. And so these were the leading bishops and cardinals and so forth. And the Council of Trent, canons and decrees of the Council of Trent, pronounced more than 100 anathemas, damning to hell anyone 
who denies the teachings of Roman Catholicism. For example, whoever says that one can be saved by faith alone in Christ's finished work on the cross without the rituals, the sacraments of the Catholic Church, which they say are essential to salvation, beginning with baptism, anathema to you. Anybody that says baptism is not essential to salvation, anathema to you. Well, the thief on the cross wasn't baptized. Many people who haven't been baptized. Anyone who dares to say that when we take the bread and the cup, as Christ said, in remembrance of him, that this is merely a memorial commemorating a work that was finished on the cross 1900 and some years ago and denies that it is an ongoing propitiatory sacrifice being offered for the sins of the living and the dead, let him be anathema. Mm -hmm. But an evangelical says, no, when Jesus said it is finished, he meant it is finished. And that in the King James is the translation of a Greek word to telestai, which they stamped on promissory notes in that day, it meant paid in full. So, back to your question. Well, Dave, these are clear distinctions between what Roman Catholics believe, and you use the term anathema, meaning to condemn, to excommunicate. And to hell. Right. So, these are clear distinctions that the Roman Catholic Church makes between what evangelicals believe, Bible-believing Christians, right. and they believe. Right. And December 31st, 1995, Pope John Paul II, in celebration of the opening of the Council of Trent, said all of its canons and decrees, everything that it, it decreed, is still in full force and effect. Mm -hmm. And it has to be because the church claims to be an infallible church, right. and these councils claim to be infallible councils. Absolutely. So, let me make sure our listeners understand this. An evangelical Christian believes that when Jesus said, to Telestai, paid in full, it's finished. The work of our redemption was finished. That Purgatory, don't need the sacraments, nope. no rituals, nothing nope. efficacious nope. in these so-called sacraments. Vatican II, the very first page, <laughs> says... It is through the sacraments of the Catholic Church, through the Mass, the sacraments, and so forth, mm -hmm. that the work of our redemption is being accomplished. No, Jesus said it's finished. The work of our redemption is finished. There's nothing we can do to add to it. It doesn't take any of our efforts. We simply accept by faith the finished work of Christ on the cross. And we could go to Hebrews 9, he has appeared once in the end of the age to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Verse 27, 28, as it is appointed unto man once to die, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. Chapter 10 begins talking about the Old Testament sacrifices. They had to be repeated daily. And the writer, I think it was Paul, but anyway, whoever wrote the epistle to the Hebrews said... The fact that they had to be repeated over and over proved that they couldn't take away sin. And then in contrast to the repetitious sacrifices of the Old Testament, the writer says, but this man, that is Jesus Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Okay. And then verse 18 says, Henceforth, there is no more sacrifice for sin. But the Catholic Church insists the Mass is a propitiatory sacrifice. Christ did not finish the work on the cross. We are still offering him. And if the Catholics of today believed what the Bible says, the Catholic Church is out of business. There's nothing for its priests to do. You don't need them as a mediator between you and Christ. You don't need them to forgive your sins and so forth. You don't need them to turn this little wafer into Jesus Christ and the wine into his blood and offer him repeatedly and over and over again. Okay? Dave, obviously, I mean, I hope it's obvious to our listeners, that is a rejection of Christ's atonement. But it, it really gets worse in practice because I was taught growing up Roman Catholic that I could expiate my own sins. How? Suffering. 
all kinds of events that took place right here in this temporal life. And then if there were residue sins, venial sins, sins that were not mortal or did not condemn me to hell and that weren't absolved, then I needed to pay for those sins to have them purged in purgatory. Again, a very practical, quote unquote, practical expiation of my own sins through my own suffering in purgatory for how long? Nobody knows. In the flames of purgatory. Right. But that is but absolutely... Which, just to add to that, Dave, which uh, Thomas Aquinas and others, how they knew, I don't know, but they said that the flames of purgatory were far worse than the flames of hell. I guess because, you know, no one steps across the threshold as a Roman Catholic. No one steps across the threshold into heaven until all their sins are absolutely purged. By their own suffering in purgatory, okay? The suffering of Christ was not enough. Now, then we have, Tom, I, we don't want to get into the whole thing about Catholicism, but here we have a contradiction, big contradiction. It's right there in Vatican II, right in the teaching that you've been giving us from the Catholic Church. The sufferings of Christ upon the cross were not enough to pay for your temporal sins, all right? You have to have temporal sufferings. So what do they do? They re-offer him in the Mass. Oh, wait a minute. What he did on the cross was not good enough, but if you re-offer him enough times, then that'll take care of it. Or someone else, while you're in purgatory, can suffer for your sins. To shorten the time of suffering in purgatory, yet the sacrifice of Christ, where he said it is finished and he paid the full penalty, that's not enough. Tom, I get a bit angry about that because people are being lied to, and you don't know how many masses have to be said. Henry VIII, King Henry VIII of England, he left a fortune for mass after mass after mass to be said in order to get him out of purgatory. I probably have mentioned it before, but a friend of mine at the funeral of his father, he said more than $2,000 in mass cards were purchased to put on the altar when the priest says mass with the name of the deceased in it so that he would be, his time in purgatory would be shortened, but no one could tell you how much it would be shortened, how long it would take, and so forth. It just keeps the Catholic Church in business, and it keeps the Roman Catholics in bondage to this church. Yeah, suffering widows. Bad enough they've lost their loved ones, but then to send whatever income, whatever money they have after that false idea. That's a crime, Dave, yeah. I think. So anyway, Tom, getting back to where we got off onto this. Well, this is a clear distinction between, as we said, right. evangelical Christianity, Bible-believing Christians. If you call yourself a evangelical, if you say you're a Bible-believing Christian, you go by the Bible. It's as simple as that. That's right. But the, as you said earlier, the, the Roman Catholic Church claims to go by the sacred scriptures, but in fact, uh, that's overruled by sacred tradition and the magisterium, the teaching office of the church. Okay, so who are the friends of the nation of Israel? Evangelical Christians, and we have to make a distinction. They did not persecute Jews. They are the supporters of Israel. Probably a very high percentage of the tourists that go there that still have the courage to go in spite of the terrorism and so forth would be evangelical Christians. Mm -hmm. Dave, you mentioned this man, William Blackstone, who was a uh, English jurist. And this is back in the 1800s, 1878. He wrote a, a little booklet titled, Jesus is Coming. And some of the things that he says, I mean, he searched the scriptures and he came to these conclusions based on his readings of the scripture that Jesus had to return. And where? It has to be to Israel. Let me take a quote that you have from him regarding God's chosen people. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Quote, but perhaps you say, I don't believe the Israelites are to be restored to Canaan and Jerusalem rebuilt. Dear reader, have you read the declaration of God's words about it? Surely nothing is more plainly stated in the scriptures. We beg of you to read the biblical passages thoughtfully. Divest yourself of prejudice and preconceived notions, and let the Holy Spirit show you, from his word, the glorious future of God's chosen people who are beloved, Romans 11.28, 
and dear unto him as the apple of his eye, Zechariah 2.8. Dave, now correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't Mark Twain visit Jerusalem right around that time, the end of the 1800s? And yeah, he visited Israel. He said it was a wasteland. They traveled a long distance without even seeing an animal. It was just a desert. Of course, one of the reasons for that was because the Turks, who had that for 400 years, they would tax you on trees. If you had a tree, you were taxed. So they cut down the trees. They chopped down everything and burned it up for firewood. So Israel became either a desert or a marsh, a swamp. I think it was the St. Louis Dispatch had a reporter there. Maybe they were following Mark Twain at the same time. And they said Jerusalem had 40,000 inhabitants, 30,000 were Jews, 10,000 were Christians of various shades, you know. Mm -hmm. And I don't recall any mention of any Arabs even, even being there at that time. And this was in the 1880s. Prophecy was going to be fulfilled there, according to the scriptures. Well, the scripture said it would blossom like a, a garden, and that is the case today. Mm -hmm. And the Israelis have done that with God's help. And it is quite a contrast to all the Arab territories around them. And there are reasons for that. Remember, we mentioned in the disengagement of Gaza that the Israelis who were living in Gaza, they had huge greenhouses. And that was the one thing they left intact so that the Palestinians who were taking over could make a living and could be productive. And the very first thing the Palestinians did, they came in there, mobs, and they just tore those greenhouses apart just for whatever piece of junk they could get out of them, the plastic or the metal or whatever, destroyed the whole thing. So there is a basic reason why Israel is productive and the nations around them are not. It's the mentality of these people. And the mentality of the Palestinians, of course, is to hate Israel. If they would learn something from the Israelis, they could prosper. But you know, the money, the billions of dollars that were given to Arafat from the West to build factories and to make his people productive, he put them in Swiss bank accounts or used them for uh, terrorism. Mm -hmm. My arms. Right. Tom, I would like to read something here by a couple of authors. It's from the introduction of a book, The Secret War Against the Jews. And this may be slightly off of our, our subject here. But far from evangelical Christians being the enemies of Israel, as many Jews think, and they don't make that distinction between evangelicals, the governments of this world, that's one of the things we point out in this book, the governments of this world have betrayed Israel down through history. And let me just try to read some excerpts from the introduction. It's shocking. The major powers of the world have repeatedly planned covert operations to bring about the partial or total destruction of Israel. Long before there even was a Jewish state in Palestine, Western spies already were out to wreck the Zionist dream. The savage extent of the secret wars against the Jews will horrify the Western public. goes on. He's talking about Western governments. Our governments do not want their own citizens to know that a covert double standard has applied to the Jews, so they have lied to us for half a century. You may not be convinced that what this book declares is true in all respects, but at least you may be convinced that much of what has hitherto been accepted history is either false or at best seriously deficient. Our only claim for this book is that it is an accurate account of how many spies view the West's conduct toward Israel. This is their story, a very different look at history. So in contrast to the feeling of Israelis that Christians have been their enemies, it's really the governments of the Western world, which are the successors to the Roman Catholic Church. The popes once owned the whole world, and it is the evangelical Christians who are their true friends. And so that's, I think, a very important distinction uh, that needs to be made and one which we try to make in this book. We also make a case for evangelical Christianity, not only being biblical, but being true. 
and we prove that from prophecy and from history. So this gentleman, William Blackstone, he convened a conference between Jews and Christians in 1890, and it resulted in the Blackstone Petition of 1891, later known as Blackstone Memorial. It was signed by 413 outstanding Christian and Jewish leaders, including Supreme Court Chief Justice Melville W. Fuller, Speaker of the House of Representatives, Thomas B. Reed, and, and so forth. And he presented the petition to President Benjamin Harrison, March 5, 1891. Uh, it requested that, look, this land belongs to the Jewish people scattered all over this world and persecuted. They ought to be brought back uh, into their own land. And you could say that was a, a big boost to the so-called Zionist movement. He was more of a Zionist than many of the Jews were. And there were other evangelicals. Theodore Herzl, his close friend, William H. Heckler, another evangelical. So we give the details of some of these people who worked very hard to turn the opinion of the world from anti-Israel to let's give these people back the land that God gave to them that belongs to them. And of course, the Bible said that they would get. Mm -hmm. And the nations of this world are still opposing God in only allowing Israel to have a very small fraction. And then they keep eroding that. Every peace proposal, Israel, give more land away. So I think, Tom, that we uh, point out some things in, in this book that are very, very important for Christians and Jews and the whole world to know. And Dave, sadly, our State Department, our own U.S. State Department, is one of the biggest culprits in all of this. Against Israel. Mm -hmm. Please visit our website, thebereancall.org, to access our radio archives going back to 1999 and our newsletter going back to 1986. We offer daily updates by email or visit us on Facebook or Twitter. Are you looking for information about a specific topic? Go to the BereanCall.org and click on Topics at the top of the page. Our online store is thebereancall.com. We offer a wide variety of books, tracks, CDs, and DVDs. Note that most of our ebooks are free. I'm Gary Carmichael. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope you can join us again next week. Until then, we encourage you to search the scriptures 24 7. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back. No turning back.